Gospel Broadcasting Network presents Faith Building Sermons. I am your speaker, John Grubb. Please join me as we study God's Word to help us build up our faith. It's good to be together again as we continue our study of God's Word. Today we're discussing an Old Testament story found in 2 Kings as we talk about a prophet of God named Elijah. And the title of our lesson is Elijah's God and God's Elijah. In the second chapter of 2 Kings, verses 6 through 16, the Bible records the transition from Elijah being the prophet of God to Elisha replacing Elijah, continuing the work that he had been doing. Elijah and Elisha, they were prophets of God. They didn't write books like other Old Testament prophets, but the work that they did during that Old Testament period was very important to the people of God. And there is much we can learn from the prophet Elijah and the life that he lived. If you begin reading in 1 Kings, chapter 17, you read of the uh, life of Elijah, and the background for this lesson today is from 1 Kings chapter 16, verses, verse 29 through the 19th chapter, verse 21, and then of course, 2 Kings, verse 1 beginning, tells the story of the transition. In this lesson today, we're going to examine why Elijah was such a great prophet. During this period of time, Elisha was in a state of uncertainty as he stood there on the bank of Jordan with the mantle of Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He had been following Elijah for days, carefully observing his every move. Elijah, by the commandment of the Lord, had anointed Elisha to become the prophet in his place. And it had been revealed that Elijah would soon be taken up. Knowing this, Elisha had refused to leave Elijah and therefore had traveled with him everywhere. If you have your Bible today, open to 2 Kings chapter 2 as we read together verses 8 through 14. 2 Kings chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So we read here of the transition that was made. And note what Elisha says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah. So today we're talking about Elijah's God 
and God's Elijah. And we're going to note some principles from this passage of Scripture that will help us to understand things that will help us in our life today. Number one, let's talk about Elijah's God. What shall we look for in Elijah's God? What are some of his characteristics? What kind of God is he? How can we identify him? He can be identified, at least in part, on the basis of his dealings with Elijah. Number one, Elijah's God is a God who guides his people. This is not to say that God uses miraculous methods today to guide his people because we know that the age of miracles ended in the first century when the New Testament, the final revelation of God, was completed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul writes, Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And so Paul talks about the miraculous gifts that existed in the first century before the New Testament was recorded and confirmed. When that took place, when that which is perfect or complete is come, Paul tells us, then that which is in part, those miraculous gifts, would cease, would stop, would no longer be available. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the Hebrew writer adds, Therefore, Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to His own will. Jude verse 3 tells us, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. God guided Elijah by the use of words. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2, 3, 8, and 9, God uses words to tell Elijah what he wants him to do. And the word of the Lord came at him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. Then skipping down to verse 8, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. How did God tell Elijah to do these things? By his word. This was also true in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Every step that Elijah took was by divine direction. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, 
and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. We know that man cannot direct his own steps, and therefore needs the guidance of God to know the right way to go. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. O Lord, I know that it is that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. How does faith come? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. All of the great men of the past were men who depended on God to guide them. Because Elijah's God is a God who guides His people. And God continues to guide His people today. All we have to do is open the pages of the New Testament and learn what God wants us to do for Him. He will guide us as we seek His will. Elijah's God is a God who hides His people. He protects His people. Again, this is not something that God does today miraculously, but by providence. When Elijah needed a place to hide from the vicious wrath of Ahab and Jezebel, God hid him. Once God hid Elijah, Ahab and Jezebel were not able to find him. Time would not permit us today to name all of those that God hid in time of trouble and danger. You can think of Moses as a baby. God protected him from Pharaoh. David hiding in caves from King Saul when Saul wanted to take his life. Jesus both as an infant and as an adult, as he was on the earth, God providing protection for him. Thinking of all the examples of the Apostle Paul on occasions when God protected Paul from danger and disaster. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6 tells us, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Elijah's God is a God who provides for his people. He guides his people. He hides his people. He provides for his people. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 4 through 16, Elijah is provided for by God during a drought. He's fed by ravens. He's fed by a widow. God provided the Israelites with manna when they were in the wilderness for 40 years. God provides for His people. Psalm 37, verse 25. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. In Matthew chapter 6, Verses 25 through 33, Jesus talks about the things that we need to sustain life. Food, drink, clothing. God provides that for us. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. As we serve God, God will provide for our needs. Luke 6 and verse 38 also adds, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye give, it shall be measured to you again. God provides for those that live for Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having 
all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Note the word all in that passage. Mention over and over again. God providing for his people. And so when we talk about Elijah's God, we recognize the care and the concern that he shows for us. Secondly, we look at God's Elijah. Whenever and wherever you find God's Elijah, you will find a man who prays. In James chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, James uses Elijah as an example of prayer. He says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Know what he says beginning in verse 17. He says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. This is also illustrated in the contest on Mount Carmel as recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 through 38. It was on that occasion that Elijah wanted to show the people who was the true God. Was it the God of Elijah or was it Baal? And so on that occasion, the Bible says it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and thou hast turned their heart back again. That's verse 37 of 1 Kings chapter 18. And then verse 38 of that chapter. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. In these three verses, we see Elijah once again availing himself of the privilege of prayer because God's Elijah is a man who prays. After this contest, Elijah prays again to bring back the rain that had been stopped for three and a half years. Not only was Elijah a man of prayer, but other great men of God prayed as well. Thinking of Paul and Peter, David and Daniel, Moses, and of course the perfect example given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in prayer. God's Elijah is a man who prays. God's Elijah is also a man who obeys. Each time God commanded Elijah to do something, even though he did not necessarily want to do it, he obeyed. When we find a man today like God's Elijah, he will be a man of obedience. He will not complain or offer excuses but he will obey God's will. God has not prepared for us a life of ease or tell us that living the Christian life will be something that is very easy to do. But he has promised eternal life to those that obey him and are faithful to the end. Yes, God's Elijah prays he obeys and he stays. Elijah was a stayer. No compromise. No surrender. He had stayability or 
stability. God's Elijah is a stable worker. John the Baptist was the same way. The one who came in the spirit of Elijah. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. And so we today must persevere to the end. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Perhaps one of the greatest needs in the church today is more men like God's Elijah, who cannot be moved or changed by every new doctrine that comes along. In 1 Kings, we're reminded once again of the contest on Mount Carmel. You will remember during that period that Elijah had prayed to God that it would not rain. And it had not rained for three years and six months. Well, it's interesting that, the, that Baal was the weather god of the Phoenicians. And so here is the weather god of the Phoenicians, Baal, who is not able to provide the rain that the people need. And you can imagine the pleading and the sacrifices that were made to Baal to try to get him to cause it to rain. And so God used this occasion to prove to Ahab and Jezebel and Israel that Baal was a false god. He was not the true God. That the true God, the God of Israel, was the one that brought them out of Egyptian bondage, that caused them to conquer the promised land and to inherit that land that flowed with milk and honey. And yet during that period of time, king after king rejected God, rejected God's plan, rejected God's law, and instead turned to idols to worship them. That was true of Israel. And so it was on this occasion, recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18, that a contest was arranged between the prophets of Baal and God's prophet Elijah. And it was on that occasion that two sacrifices were built, one by the prophets of Baal, one by Elijah. And the prophets of Baal spent all day trying to get their God to burn up their sacrifice. The contest was whoever sacrificed was burnt would prove which God was the true God. They did all kinds of things. You can read it as you have opportunity in 1 Kings chapter 18. To get Baal to burn their sacrifice, it didn't happen. And so finally, Elijah, not only had he built the sacrifice of stone and wood and had the animal on the top, <clears throat> but he dug a trench around the sacrifice and poured 12 uh, buckets of water in that trench. Imagine, here's a drought and he's pouring water into the trench. And then he prayed, as we noted just a moment ago, and the fire came down from heaven and usually, you know, fire burns up. But this fire burnt down. It burnt the sacrifice, then the wood, then the stone, then licked up all the water out of the trench, proving that God was the true God. And then, of course, on that occasion, the prophets of Baal were put to death. But during that period of time, in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, the Bible records, And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They didn't have good and honest hearts. They had already made up their mind what they were going to do. And so it was on that occasion that the contest had to be conducted to change the people's minds. We today, as Elijah was, are challenged with compromise and surrender. And there are many today who have come to the knowledge of the truth who have been walking in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1 
and verse 7. But for one reason or another have departed from the faith. And so what we need to find today are people who have good and honest hearts, who have the stability of men like Elijah, who will not compromise, who will not surrender, who will not give up. Where are God's Elijahs today? If we stay and fight and, and don't surrender, don't give up, don't go back into the world, then we will be counted as one of God's Elijahs. God's Elijahs will stay and fight to the end. And so it is our plea, if you have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you haven't begun your trip to heaven. And so in order to begin that trip, you need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your every sin. You need to confess your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then to be immersed in water, your sins can be washed away. You will be added to the Lord's church. You will be in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. And then as we live each day putting God first, living according to His teachings, worshiping regularly with the saints, studying God's Word on a daily basis, praying to God so that we have that communication open with God. He speaks to us through His Word. We speak to Him through prayer. Developing our spiritual life, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we do all of these things, then God will bless us in our lives. We'll also have the opportunity to help others who live in this world who have not yet had the opportunity to hear the gospel, to believe it, and obey it. And what a privilege it is to serve in the ranks of God as did the prophets of old, like Elijah, Elisha, and other great men mentioned both in the old and the New Testament. Today we've talked about God's Elijah and Elijah's God. Elijah's God is still living and active among the world and he has told us what we can do to be pleasing unto him. We're looking for God's Elijah's to step up, to stand up, and to serve God acceptably so that we might have a home throughout eternity in heaven. We hope that if you're interested in doing more for the cause of Christ, that you will let us help you to both understand and then do those things that are pleasing unto God. This has been Faith Building Sermons with John Grubb on Gospel Broadcasting Network. Thank you for tuning in. Please join us again as we continue to study lessons from God's Word designed to help us build up our faith.